Uh, thanks. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me. This is, I think, my, I can't remember now, my uh, third, I think, uh, Fed, Fed Talk, Cornell Fed Talk talk. So it's uh, really nice to be back uh, at, uh, at Cornell, it's like the cold, it is cold. And I know it's going to get colder. Um, if this is good, this is going to be some disagreement here, which is, uh, which is what makes these kind of dev events uh, interesting and fun. Um, I probably fit more in the number one category uh, of the three that we that we saw there. Although I I think Adam Smith would be one and three. So, or he would be three, and as a consequence, one. But we can. It's such a good question because, of course, there's the two books. Yes, and it. Uh, I think this could be together. Though, so, so, but yes, I. Uh, so. Um, so I'm going to take a completely different approach. I'm going to take a more philosophical approach. And then I'll come back to some of the issues that were raised because I think they're important. And some of them I'll cover here and some of them we'll cover in our, in our discussion. It's great because, um, because we both deal with finance. So I think the examples we're going to raise, I think we financial ones. I was a finance professor a long time ago. Um, even, so even though I'm going to approach this philosophically, we'll, we'll then get into the practical uh, if, if you guys want to in the Q&A. Um, so, to me, the question, the moral question, fundamentally is, uh, what is the kind of society that breeds individual human flourishing? I don't like concepts like social welfare, public good, common good, because I don't know what they mean. Yes, we can aggregate them, but if some people are really suffering a lot, does that justify, and this is the whole issue about inequality, for example, does that justify some people doing really, really well? How do you even measure that? All those things. I want to build a society. I'm looking for a society where individuals are free to pursue their function. Some of them will succeed, some of them will fail. They still have big inequalities, maybe. But the society is not built to optimize some utilitarian function. The society is built to optimize your ability to pursue your happiness. Um, and I think, uh, so I think that the, I, I love the Declaration of Independence, but we got that, right? So happiness is one of my favorite terms. Uh, I like the whole idea of a government is to, to do basically one thing, and that is protect your freedom, to protect your rights, to life, liberty, and property, and the pursuit of happiness. Why? And this is really the question of why do we need government at all? Why can't we just go out there into the world and pursue stuff we want and figure stuff out as we go along? So if you take a step back, what does it mean? What is the tool that we as human beings need in order to achieve any value, in order to pursue happiness, in order to pursue anything really? What is it? What is it that we need to be able to do? What is it the one skill set that we have as humans that's unique to human beings that it makes possible? This hall, this technology, cool, microphones, all of that. What, what, what makes it all possible? Where does it come from? No question. What makes us human? Intelligence. Yeah, intelligence, our minds. Our capacity to think, our capacity to reason, our capacity to conceptualize, not our thumbs. It is our mind, our ability to think rationally about the world. That is what fundamentally makes us human. To be successful as human beings, we need to be successful at solving problems. We need to be successful at understanding reality and ultimately at shaping reality to fit, shaping nature, shape the world that it fit our needs as human beings. We're not programmed to know what's good or bad, or what, what is a successful path, what is a lousy path. We, we just are not that kind of animal. We are programmed to self-program, to figure out, based on the evidence before us, what is the right path to go by. And what reason, what human rationality requires to do that is, you know, what some people call an open mind. It needs to be able to explore, it needs to be able to look, it needs to be able to think the unthinkable. It needs to be able to take in all the evidence and conclude 
whatever conclusions, whatever the data shows. So what the mind needs in order to really uh, optimize its performance in terms of human flourishing, what it needs is freedom. What it needs is the ability to think outside of the box, to think new thoughts, and not be interfered. We know what happens when it's interfered. We know what happens to Galileo. We know what happens to whole sections of human history where, the, where people are not allowed to think, where people are not allowed to act based on those thoughts. At the end of the day, the enemy of reason, the enemy of rationality, is force, it's coercion, it's authority that tells us what we can and cannot do, what we can and cannot think, what we can and cannot act towards. That's the enemy of human fortune because it restricts what we can look at and what conclusions we can come to. And when we come together in a society, there are people that will use force, that will try to impose their authority upon us. There are people who will use coercion in order to achieve their means. And in my view, the role of government, and really the only role of government, is to stop them. It's to protect us from them. In other words, create a space in which we are free as individuals to do as we please, to Find the things that will lead to our success, our happiness, our values, the things that we care about, based on our conclusions, based on our judgments, including the idea that we often fail, right? Failure is part of life. But it leaves us free to learn from those failures and figure it out and to, and to band together with other people and to form corporations, to form businesses or societies or whatever kind of entities we form with other people. But based on the principle of each one of us is a free individual, free to live their lives as they see fit without other people speaking fit. Government is there to protect us. It's to protect that freedom. And, you know, this is a thing somewhat consistent with the ideas the founders had. The idea of rights, the Lockean notion of rights, the idea that rights are really freedoms of action, they're not freedoms to think, they're not rights to think, they're rights to act. And by protecting your right to act, you're protecting your ability to live your life by your mind, by your standard. And then whatever happens, happens. How the economy then organizes once we restrict Restrict coercion, eliminate force, eliminate authority. What happens? Well, we don't know exactly, but we got pretty close to it, you know, after the founding of the country. Put aside slavery, the abomination of slavery. There was a lot of freedom. And what we got were free markets. Free markets are not imposed by government. Free markets are what evolves when government gets out of the way. Free markets are what evolved when government stepped back, and all it does is serve to protect our rights. And part of that protection involves defining, helping define those rights, the scope of those rights, like property. Where does the property begin? Where does it end? Those are not easy questions to answer. You guys will probably take a property class and you'll discover that, right? It's certainly so difficult when you get into intellectual property. Some of these questions are tricky questions, and that's why we need. And legislature. That's why we need a government to figure this out, to debate, to argue, to discuss, and ultimately come up with a conclusion. And what are the limits? What is force? What is coercion? Again, a big legal issue. But that's what we need government to do: is to define those things and present it with objective, hopefully, laws that we can all understand and know. There's certain things I cannot do because it violates somebody else's freedom. But to me. That is the role of government. And from that role, markets emerge. And yes, the consequence of that is that much of what's on the books today, much of what government does today, hard to tell how much, but I would argue maybe 80%, maybe more, 
does not fit into my definition of good government. Government is probably about, could probably shrink about 80% and fulfill what I would like to see government doing and nothing more. In my world, government does basically three things. It, 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 in order to protect us, you need a police force, you need a military, and you need a judiciary system. In order to help arbitrate disputes, you need a legislature, and that's it. The legislature, executive branch, and a judiciary, but basically that's it. It doesn't need to act in society in any other capacity. We as private citizens, in pursuit of our values, in pursuit of our life, based on our own ideas, can sort everything else out. Do I have solutions to every problem presented out there? Well, of course not. I don't believe in central planning. I'm not going to have solutions. But I have a strong belief that markets solve these problems. And when markets are tested, they do solve these problems. Markets fail. There's no question that because individuals fail. We fail as individuals. So when we put us together, yes, markets can fail. But the best way out of market failure is to allow the market to explore, to test, to, to try different things, to figure out solutions, to come out of that solutions. The worst thing, in my view, for market failure is for a central planner to then step and say, I know how to fix it. I know how to do it right. I know what the solution is. And of course, that's to some extent a final word because then the process become political. It doesn't become a process of voluntary exchange, a process of interaction, which is what markets are based on, the idea of voluntary exchange. So government is there to protect us, leave us alone. Once they achieve that protection, none of that is simple, granted, but as a consequence, government would be a lot smaller. And in my ideal, in an ideal form of government, I would actually see a separation between state and economics. I don't believe the government has the tools, the ability, or the right to regulate markets, including financial markets, including other markets, even when they fail. Uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about the welfare state, I'm happy to talk about specific market failures and specific regulations, but you know, I'm a radical when it comes to the role of government. I want it shrunk as small as possible to that statement in the Declaration, section of right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Errol, I'm just going to ask you to move your chair just a little bit closer so you're also in the frame with Professor Ari. Oh, wait, yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect. perfect. That's perfect. Chop half my head up. <laughs> that's perfect. Um, Professor Ari, you sort of very different perspectives on the role of government. Um, what's your initial reaction to that, just to get us going with the discussion? Yeah, I will absolutely uh, keep it short uh, because I think it's right that one of the, the problems that I struggle with in my clear category three world is that we are constantly debating the definition of welfare and the precise types of market failures that exist. You know, there's conceptual tools there that are contested in effect. But then I wanna highlight that um, uh, Yanzhou is, has its own version of this, I think, which is the definition of freedom, where there are competing versions of what qualifies as freedom, right? I, this is a, um, probably not new to any of you uh, whatsoever. Um, and again, like the choices that I'm trying to make about uh, welfare and the application of specific tools, we're also making choices about which version of freedom uh, we want uh, to see. There's the lawful freedom of action. There are other, you know, dating back to the same uh, time period, other conceptions of freedom that do envision a potentially different role from the state in um, uh, creating a, a positive freedom, a, a freedom of opportunity uh, that also sort of deserves a fair hearing in these type of debates. They aren't antithetical to discussions about free markets. Um, uh, the example that I was uh, given in this regard uh, is the poor 
kid growing up in terrible circumstances within a terrible school system that has few opportunities. A free society wants that person to fulfill their potential. Um, and in doing that, we have to ask the question whether negative uh, freedoms, freedom from state intervention uh, and freedom of action are sufficient to make sure that that flourishing happens. Um, not because uh, we care about the individual, although we do, but we care about society's uh, benefits from having that individual um, uh, reach their maximum potential, or at least have the opportunity to reach that maximum potential. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And, yeah. Sure. yeah, I'll just comment and then we'll take questions. Um, so take that, take that individual. So I, I think we all agree we want that individual. So we have the, have the ability or the opportunity to flourish. Uh, and and uh, and be successful. I I would take the perspective. of, Yes, I do care about the individual. Individuals matter to me. It's it's not about what that individual contributes to society that matters to me. It's his ability to live a happy life that matters to me. I think I think that is uh, my you know my moral perspective is individual happiness, individual flourishing. I want every individual not to achieve it because you can't guarantee that, but to have the opportunity for that. Um, I asked myself, particularly today, right, I, I'd ask myself, why is this kid poor in a rich country like America? Why is he getting such a crummy education in a rich country like America? Why are we living in, in, a, in, a, in a time where the country is so rich and yet there's some people who, and, and some people concentrate in certain places and certain communities getting such horrible lives? And he's like, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a massive injustice and it's horrible. Um, and I come to the conclusion that much of it is uh, as a consequence of a lack of free market. As much too much a central planner's attempt to relieve him, to relieve this kid of, uh, uh, of, 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 his, of his suffering, let's call it, uh, is actually causing that suffering. Uh, that the welfare state is to a large extent responsible for these problems, that it's no accident that public education is, uh, is you know, stratified. It's clear that public education, the worst education is provided to the poorest people. And it's not even close. Uh, if you're middle class, upper class in the United States, you get a decent public education. People complain about how horrible public education is in the U.S., but middle class and, and, and wealthy do fine. Right? But if you're poor in America, the public educational system is horrific. Why? Because it's public. Imagine an educational system that actually took the customer into account. Poor people don't get bad services in almost any other realm. They don't get the same level, maybe. They don't get bad services in any other realm. They don't get worse cars than, I mean, the cars that they get are still decent. The, 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 you know, they still, they still go into stores, they can buy stuff. Yes, cheaper, but they get good quality stuff. There's no reason they cannot be provided in a private market with good quality education. If you had competition, if you had innovation, if you had people driven to try to provide them with good education because they because there was a market incentive to do so. So I'd like to see in all these different realms real market competition, real innovation, real progress. And then, you know, for kids who fall between the cracks, and there are always going to be some, there are always going to be some uh, situations where people don't get uh, the opportunities that we would like them to get. There are plenty of benevolent people that would love to help out. And that's what civil society is about. We help out people that we want to help out in ways that we want to do it. And we choose the ways that we want to do it. And we do it more as, a, as something we want to do rather than something we pay taxes to and forget and let other people do it. And we're not really interested in how they do it and what they do exactly. So I think freedom, and, and I'll define my version of freedom in a second. I think freedom actually solves the problems we're trying to solve. It solves them by leaving individuals free it solves them by taking the tools that the market has and applying them 
to every aspect of our lives, not to the just to the aspects of life that, again, I think central planners have decided these government should do and these the market can do. Why? There's not, no difference in education and healthcare between uh, those and any other field in which markets deliver products brilliantly. There's no reason they can't deliver products brilliantly in those two fields. And there's plenty of evidence uh, globally and in the U.S. that they have and that they can deliver those uh, products in that way. Let me just define, you know, my view of freedom. Yes, freedom is a contested definition. You, you could go, I could go to a room of Marxist or a room of any version and ask them, are you for freedom and every high would go up? Nobody in the world is against freedom. We just don't define it the same way. So we're not all for the same thing. We're for different things. Uh, I believe freedom is the opportunity to, you know, to act free of coercion. It's the freedom of from coercion and force. Any other definition of freedom, I think, is self-contradictory. It actually involves subjugating somebody else to your freedom. I think the only definition of freedom that does not involve subjugating somebody else to you is where we're all free. And therefore, we don't have, so therefore, all that's required is no force, no coercion, no imposing your will on me, and I can't do the same to you. So I don't sacrifice to you, you don't sacrifice to me, uh, and that's real freedom. That's awesome. And just in the interest of time, I'd love to just turn it over to student questions, both here in person and online. From online, um, please raise your hand and, and we'll get to you. But uh, Josiah, why don't you start us off? Um, Dr. Brooke, you just described the hypothetical reality of a poor young child and talked about uh, the ways that he interacts with services, both public and private. Yeah. But bringing that into reality, you described the opposite of what I grew up with as a poor child, the only services that I got anywhere close to the level of the richer kids around me or those provided by the public, namely school, food, and the like. So I'm wondering how you would support those claims about poor children empirically. Um, obviously, I'm only one anecdote. I don't trump your argument. Sure. I sure. I mean, uh, first I'll say, uh, you know, uh, hopefully you got a good education as a poor kid, but the, you had lousy education. I had lousy education because my parents refused to put me in public schools. Oh, uh, the empirics are, I think, pretty clear that uh, poor kids get a lousy education in public schools. Um, you know, you can take statistics out of the city of Chicago, the inner city of Chicago, where uh, schools are basically holding pens. Um, very little education happens there. And across the street, there'll be a, uh, a Catholic school. Same neighborhood, same kids. And it does quite well, right? And those kids do very well. I mean, you can, you know, if you look it up on, on Google, Martha Collins, who used to have a school in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the very poor areas of Chicago, her kids all went to college, right? Same kids, same, but, but these were private institutions. By the way, Archdiocese of Chicago, this, these are numbers that are probably, I don't know, 10 years old, but at the time, Charge seventy five hundred dollars a kid. Uh, the public schools in Chicago charge fifty thousand a kid. So this is at half price, much better education. Um, if you if you look globally at uh, uh, private education provided to poor kids, uh, there's a there's a wonderful uh, book written by a British academic at Buckingham University in the UK by the name of James Tooley uh, called "The Beautiful Tree." Highly recommend the book. It's a it's a wonderful book. Uh, whether you land up agreeing with me or not. Um, and, and basically what they find, they did research on schools in um, Nigeria and India, in the slums. And what they find in those slums is that the kids don't, nobody goes to public, public schools. So the assumption was always that parents don't send their kids to school. They keep them home. They don't want them to go to school. And when they went actually into the slums to investigate, what they discovered is networks of hundreds of private, little private schools where the education was as good, if not better, than the public school, but it was in the local community. Parents paid, um, not a lot, because the, the, the school was, was, was in the community. The, the teacher wasn't making a lot of money, and they didn't have these big institutions that a school is, and, and it was a lot more cost-effective. 
Hundreds of these schools now, James Tooley is building schools all over Africa, kind of to, based on their model. So it's doable. It's, it, it, it's happening out there in the world in terms of schools and empirical evidence to the poor quality of public schools, I think is pretty evident in the United States. Um, I, I agree with you that, uh, that you're not getting the same quality services in the public sector as, as middle class or, or, or wealthy people do. But look, a, a, a cheap car today in the United States, the cheapest car that you can buy, a Kia or whatever, does the job. It's functional. Um, there is, a, you know, almost in every realm that the private sector produces goods, it produces cheap stuff and expensive stuff, and the cheap stuff is of decent quality. Much better, by the way, than what you could have got 20 years ago for a lot more money. Uh, the private sector moves to make things cheaper and better over time. That's its methodology. And it doesn't want to cut out a whole section of the population because there's money to be made from that section of population. Less, and they sell them different products. But, you know, I want to apply that to the entire you know, the entire spectrum of humanity, not just to the people who can afford it, and keep poor people with government services, which I don't think are very good. This uh, goes back to our different definitions of freedom and the, my last pitfall, which is the provision of non-market goods uh, working within that framework. So your forward focus will get you from A to B just in the same way that a Maserati will. But your degree from uh, the University of East Wichita State will not give you access to the same opportunities as your degree from Cornell or Harvard. We know it, right? We know it intuitively, we know it in the data. And how that relates to freedom is the fact, well, look where our lawmakers come from, right? Look who holds the positions of power in politics, finance, broader society. The folks at Harvard and Cornell, not the folks from people, from, uh, not the folks that, that went to East Wichita State. And there's a freedom dimension to this, which is that if our representatives are systematically taken across business and other um, uh, elite professions uh, from this category, uh, then we end up with a political system that is that caters to those interests and does not cater to the guy from East Wichita State. So just to, like. We can both be talking about freedom, yep. and we can both be fairly concerned with, I think, very similar uh, types of outcomes that we want to achieve. Uh, but depending on these subtle differences, we can look at the same hypothetical as, as really very different. Uh, to me, primary education is not something that is easy to market. So one thing we haven't talked about is the hypothetical counterfactual where all education is private. Uh, I agree that you would get huge differences in educational quality depending on the passion area for different schools. Uh, people could get together and pay higher tuition fees individually. Uh, they have more opportunity to travel farther for good schools. Uh, and what you'd see in economic terms is likely a separating equilibrium where some people would get the Ford focus of education and other people would get Maseratis. That is uh, one definition of freedom in, in that world. Equally though, uh, adopting a, a, a freedom uh, to, uh, and a freedom to actually pursue opportunities and to contribute in the same way as other members of society is another version of that freedom uh, that also has purchase. Can I make one comment? Because I, I agree about the politics. So I think that's a really interesting feature of the current system that we have. Um, and, and I would argue that that is why I don't want politicians to have power over my life. That is one of the reasons, because I think you always get that kind of outcome. You cannot create a system, a government, and we see it all over the world, no matter in which country, you always get a, a system where a certain group is overrepresented in, in politics. I want to make politicians, for the most part, impotent when it comes to control over my life. I want them to be there to have a very, very, very narrow scope so that the rest is really me and the marketplace. Now, maybe you view that as cooler or worse than the political outcome. That's possible. But I'm not suggesting let's privatize education and leave the political system the way it is. Right? I want to change the whole system, right? 
I want to change how politicians become politicians and what they do as politicians. I don't want them to be able to give favors to political to particular groups. I want to limit the scope of what they do dramatically. I want to make them very limited in their powers. So that who is in politics doesn't matter that much. Yeah, you know, politics never used to be a full-time profession in America, or at least a long time ago wasn't a full-time profession in America. But something you did, right? On in a sense on the side as a service. And then you went back to business and you had actually had a career, right? You actually know it would be good if senators and congressmen. Who, who preached to businessmen what they should and shouldn't do, actually hired some people once in a while and had to fire people and, and had a bottom line maybe to achieve once in a while. Maybe that would refine their, their, their abilities to think about what business does and what it doesn't do. Um, so I, I, I'd actually not want full-time politicians in that. Now, Mr. Meridian, I know you've been waiting online, so if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, hopefully the audio here in the room is working. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you guys hear me okay? Uh, I'm sorry. What was that? Okay, I'm, I'm a, no, okay. no, no, Ed, we, were, we were just commenting on the on the technology we have in uh, Cornell Law School here. So please, no proceed. Got it. Uh, thank you. I wanted to continue with the public school car analogy, and you mentioned how uh, poor people would have poor public school education, but they could get a Kia and a decent car at that. Uh, how do you reconcile that with the fact that there are currently millions of people that cannot afford a car? They do not have a car. And with our current system of markets, you're assuming everyone gets a car. What about all the people that do not have that same access transportation in the private market? So, you know, I don't have the numbers with me, but there are very few people in America who don't have cars. Um, I mean, if you look at poverty, at, at what constitutes poverty in the U.S., uh, and it, it's it's well over ninety percent of people have cars and homes and air conditioning and, and a lot of things that in other place parts of the world would be considered pretty well off relative to uh, uh, well, well you know poor in America is, is relatively and it's so poor but it's relatively well off as compared to places where people are really poor and compared to what places were a long time ago but look. Um, I'm not going to defend the system that exists today. There's way too much poverty in America today. There's way too many people who can't afford anything today. There are way too many homeless people today. And the way too, the cost of living is too expensive in the United States. There are, all, there are lots of problems in the U.S. today. The solution is not to double up on the system we have now. Because that's what we're doing. We're throwing more money at it. We're taxing more. We're restricting more. We're regulating more. We're throwing more money at it. And the results are not there. I'm proposing that the solution is the opposite. The solution is to free up resources. The solution of poverty is work. It's for people to actually work. And the way to get people to work is to have jobs. And, not, and to incentivize people to actually work, to take those jobs. And you do that not by giving people money. You see that right now. I think the labor shortage is partially an overhang of, of people getting people who never maybe used to get money from the government, now getting money from the government, got money from the government for a long time uh, during COVID. Uh, the solution is not to give people handouts. The solution is to leave the market free so that businessmen can create jobs, can build businesses. What economic growth requires, the, the, the thing that drives economic growth is entrepreneurship, nothing else. Entrepreneurs drive economic growth. You see that if you look at China and economic growth in China over the last 40 years, it's businesses and entrepreneurs that drove economic growth in China, not state-run enterprises. It's entrepreneurs in Europe that drive economic growth. More limited because there are fewer entrepreneurs in Europe, and therefore economic growth is more limited than it is in China and the U.S. So what you need to do is free entrepreneurs to create opportunities for people. The main opportunity is a job. And if you privatize the education, people would be better educated. If you privatize all these different elements, there would be more opportunities for people. So I, I don't believe in e equality of opportunity because I don't think that's, it's an impossible goal. And in order to increase somebody's opportunities, you have to reduce somebody else's. I believe in maximizing opportunity. A society, a free society maximizes opportunities. 
provides the most opportunities to most people. And in that kind of society, I don't think poor people can't afford a car. Now, I, I don't have the car, I don't have that society in mind, right, right there, but history suggests that. So if you look at Hong Kong, uh, pre-China taking it over last year, and you see uh, the uh, going from a fishing village to one of the most dynamic cities in the world with per capita GDP higher than the US, vast inequality, but people from other countries swam to get there because as poor as they were in Hong Kong, they were richer than they were where they came from. And in Hong Kong, they had an opportunity to go from rich to middle class to being super rich, one of the richest. Many of the richest people in Hong Kong started out with nothing. And the same was true in the United States in the 19th century, where we didn't redistribute, where we didn't um, uh, regulate and control everything. People came here with nothing. It took them a while to get something. But that something was much better than what they had where they came from. And they stayed, because that's why they stayed. They valued the freedom that they had here. And they rose up and they, within a generation or two, you know, they, they got much better, right? Different communities, different, different rates, but generally everybody improved. So I'm a big believer that, and, and I think, again, the empirical evidence suggests that when you leave people free, good things happen. Free in the sense of don't force them, don't coerce them, don't give them stuff. Let them produce the stuff. And I think, I, I, I think it's also healthy for people. I think people have a, a different sense of themselves when they create and they produce and the opportunities, are, are, they make those opportunities rather than when they hand it. So I think it's better for them psychologically. Professor, any comments? Uh, let's keep the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for taking uh, the time. Uh, Dr. Brody, this is the core of your problem uh, with the system that we have right now uh, is that in some ways uh, people's freedoms are limited uh, by the action of government. Uh, in, in many instances, though, it would seem that the polity as a whole is coming together and deciding that we need to unify to approach a certain kind of problem that might that, that we might not as individuals be able to overcome. Perhaps there's there are collective action problems or otherwise. And so if, if that's the decision that the polity as a whole is, is coming to, I'm not exactly sure what the problem is. And, and just for just as an example, would, would you suppose that a central bank is not a good idea? Central what? A central bank that 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 that, that propagates a currency by the uniform currency yeah. that is that a good or a bad idea? Should the government get involved or should they leave it to private actors to, to take aid? I, it's a great example. It's an awful idea. I think it's a terrible idea having a central bank. And, and if I had the time, we could run through why. Um, uh, I'm happy to indicate if you want. Um, but the collective action problem is the more interesting problem. You know, not the collective action, the idea that politics, they came together and they decided this. So why, right? who am I to object, right? Um, well, the polity, the uh, you know the the the, the majority uh, does not own my life. So you could all come together uh, as they did in Athens and decide that I can't speak. I'm not comparing myself to Socrates. That would be uh, ridiculous. But uh, the principle, right? Athens came together and said, you know, Socrates is corrupting our young. We're kind of democratically, with the polity is coming together and we're saying, kill him. And they basically voted on it and he accepted it and he drank the child's poison, right? I don't accept the authority of the polity of the majority to dictate my life. And again, I, I think the founders did this, right? And, and my conception, I think, of government is very similar to this, even though I'm more radical than they are. Um, you know, and that's why they didn't construct a pure majoritarian democracy where you can vote on everything. And even countries that are more majoritarian democratic, I don't know, Canada, uh, uh, Germany, France, uh, have certain, I have a certain respect for free speech where they're not going to kill Socrates, right? Why? If the majority want to kill Socrates, why don't we kill Socrates? Politics, right? Where are the limits? And I'm saying the limits are my life, every aspect of my life. A majority here can't tell me what I can and cannot own. 
what I can and cannot, um, uh, what profession I should go to, who I should or shouldn't marry, uh, you know, what I, what, I, what I can say and what I can't say. This is why I'm a free speech purist, if you will, right? You, a majority can't tell me these things, shouldn't be able to tell me these things. I, my life is mine. I start with the individual. Each one of your life is yours. You shouldn't allow other people to tell you how to live. Um, that's the, the, the moral starting unit, is that autonomy of that individual. The, 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 the fact that his life is his to make decisions for himself. So I don't buy democracy now, in that sense, right? I'm all for voting for our representatives, but then I think representatives should have very little limited, very limited say in my life. Basically, helping to protect me from you if you want to silence me. They should come in and say, no, no, you can't silence him. He has a First Amendment right to speech. That's their only job. Uh, because otherwise, leave individuals free to live their lives as they see fit. That, that's my concern. I, I, I agree that I'm in the minority and nobody agrees with me. And, and I fear that the majority will want to silence me. Among other things, right? It, it already has decided I have too much money. And they take a lot of it. I, that's why I live in Puerto Rico, so they don't get their hands on it. It's true, right? Taxes are very high. In Cal I used to live in California. 50, 55% of my income was going to taxes. If you add it all up, right, in California. I mean, that's, I, it's my money. How, do they, how does the majority get their right to take 55% of my money? For whatever causes they want. It, good causes, I'm sure all of them really have... I'm not sure, but let's assume they're all for, for, for good causes. It's none of their business, it's mine. So that's my perspective. It's an individualist perspective, a perspective by which you leave individuals alone to live their lives as they see fit, and, and you don't try to control them, and you don't try to impose your will on them. And then if you want to help other people, if you want to provide opportunities for other people, you can easily, voluntarily do so. It's not that hard. Make the effort. Instead of rallying people around to take my stuff. I don't, look, I don't, I don't, I think we all understand that violence of one individual against another individual is wrong. It's wrong for me to come to you and steal your stuff. We all accept that. But somehow, if I can get the whole classroom to vote to take your money, then it's okay for me to take your money. To me, both are theft. Just one is in the, one's legitimized for theft and one's illegitimate theft, but one's legitimate. And I don't accept legitimate theft just because you voted on it. Something that's wrong for an individual to do is wrong for a group to do as well. So we'll have one thing, because we've talked about uh, taxes, freedom, and poverty uh, at a couple of points now. And one counterpoint that has always stuck with me is, of course, that tax rates in the United States at the individual and corporate level have fallen uh, over time since uh, the post-war period. Um, and by most measures, poverty and economic inequality have increased over that same time period. And as the get the government out of my life uh, view of taxation were to really unlock the freedom that then was causally linked to reducing poverty and reducing economic inequality, shouldn't have we seen a different relationship between lower taxes and Measures of inequality in poverty. So, so what's interesting is that the federal government seems to absorb the same percentage of GDP no matter what tax rates are. 19.5% approximately, right? Fluctuates a little bit. So you could raise marginal tax rates tomorrow to 90%. And the government would actually not have that much more. It would get gained in, in the US based on how the tax laws are being written. It would gain about 19.5%. So it hasn't changed much from the 1950s to study. The absolute percentage of GDP that it takes in as taxes. It just takes them in different forms, in different places. Even measures of overall tax burden they have decreased over time. I take your point at the same time that the GDP percentage has remained roughly constant. Yeah. But that can be explained by the mere existence of uh, the tax multiplier, right? But how much the use of tax dollars actually creates a larger pie. Um, and so, so I'm not sure because I think that even though, for example, wealthy people are paying a far lower marginal tax rate than they used to. I mean, it used to be 80, 90 percent and now it's it's 30, it's just under 40 percent. 
Um, even though it's come down that marginal tax rate, the wealthy in the United States in terms of income tax pay a much larger percentage of taxes today than they did 50 years ago. So of the total taxes, the wealthy pay a much bigger chunk than they did 50 years ago, even though their marginal rates were much higher relative to everybody else. And that's because we basically, and this is because of politics, we basically now exclude large portions of the population from income taxes. We tax them in other ways. We don't let them get away scot free. We tax them in other ways. Um, but I think there's so many problems with just seeing the, the coalition. So I don't think I don't think the tax burden has really fallen. I, I don't I, I don't see that in the math. Um, corporate taxes have just come down, but, but corporate taxes are well, they've been coming down for. Uh, yeah, but corporate taxes are hidden tax on employment and on consumption. Right? Right. Nobody, right. The sure. corporations don't pay tax. That information doesn't change what you should be seeing. Right? If they're coming down, then corporations should be employing right. more people, lifting people out of poverty. They are. You. They are. But we don't, that's definitely not in the data. In terms oh. of. Oh. Data since, uh, since Trump. I and mean, I'm no final. Oh, no, I mean, no final. Data since Reagan. Uh, Think, well, I mean, it is difficult. Um, <laughs> um, I don't. I mean, I don't buy the argument that inequality. And I, I've looked at the data and I've seen economic analysis of the data. It, it, to me, it's true that the, the 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 press presents it as, and and a, and a lot of people in academia present it as, inequality has increased over the last fifty years. Game over. No, it's it, it's not in the data. Uh, if you control for size of family, uh, household composition, if you control for benefits, if you control for the fact that people are getting government benefit, uh, 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 government benefits, but also if you control for uh, the fact that wages have now gone up, but the benefits corporations pay, if you control for all these factors, inequality has not increased as dramatically as people claim it has. Um, but, Sorry. But, but let me let me just say, because we could all, yeah, I mean, that's a whole econometric argument that we could We get. don't need the econometrics, right? Benefits per person have gone down. Real wages have stagnated for 40 years. So the average American worker is earning less in real terms than they were. This is not true. But it is true. No. <laughs> we can look at the Department of Labor Statistics. Unless you don't trust the government data. No, I trust the government data. I, I, the Department I, of Labor Statistics. Yeah, but if, but if you look, but, but if you look at. <laughs> this isn't econometrics, right? This is just counting. Yes. So but it's, it's household income. Households have changed. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's a bunch of economists that have done a lot of work on this to show that no, real wages have not stagnated like the conventional story presents they have. Um, I think they, they just bunch, have. But like a dozen. Right, there's a bunch of them, but the consensus for quite a while now has been. I, that I know I fight against the consensus in almost everything in my life. But, but, but when, but, when but you get ninety-five percent of economists, I don't think it's ninety-five percent of economists believe that that have looked at it. The economists that actually looked at the stuff believe that wages are stagnated over the last few years. I don't think that's true. Well, I want to be respectful of both your times. We're sixteen minutes over, and uh, um, I want to thank you both for coming out.